Hey, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is the uh, the fourth webinar in our ERISA series, and um, I hope everyone out there is uh, enjoying the uh, the kickoff to summer uh, here in Wisconsin. It's still very much uh, cold and maybe spring-like, you know. But um, and that, one more thing before we get started here, uh, be, while uh, while Nancy and Kath and I were on, we were all complaining about the noise outside of our offices. So. <laughs> I think I've got or had a lawnmower out there uh, and the police. Um, I think Nancy said the garbage truck was on its way. Um, and Catherine is apparently like below a school or a playground. So if you wonder, you know, what's going on, it could be any of those sounds. Um, but today we're going to be talking about uh, two topics, uh, totally unrelated. First, we're going to explore uh, some post Montanil trends that we're seeing um, regarding disbursement and dissipation of funds. And then second, uh, Catherine's gonna give us a refresher course on the impacts of stop loss and a, uh, addressing some of the, the standard arguments that you'll face. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna preview uh, next month's um, uh, seminar, which is gonna be a little bit different than what we've done so far. Um, so stick around for that preview. So first of all, first off, um, I guess let's let's turn to um, what really happened in Montanil. Um, so, because we're going to be trying to address these post Montanil trends and issues, let's. It's really going to be important for us to kind of understand what that case stood for and what it didn't stand for. So, um, just to, as a reminder, the, the typical case case settled for five hundred thousand dollars after paying his lawyers and. Um, their costs and fees, he netted about $240,000. Note to self, that is less than half the settlement going to lawyers. Wonder who's really who's really driving these cases anyhow. But um, the, the, the net settlement funds were held in trust uh, by the attorney while they attempted to negotiate the plan's $121,000 lien. Um, Behind the scenes, I know that there was a lot of uh, delay in getting back to the plaintiff's lawyers with any kind of settlement uh, talks. And so that um, I, I'm sure we've seen that in a lot of the cases that we work on for groups is that not, not all of them are, are really, really prompt in responding. And that ultimately became a problem here because when negotiations broke down, um, what happened was the attorney sent out a letter saying, hey, you've got 14 days and I'm dispersing these funds. Um, so if I don't hear back from you, so be it. And ultimately he did disperse, um, but the plan didn't promptly bring suit and continued to try and negotiate. When those efforts finally broke down, uh, the plan did get authority to file suit, but that was six months later. Um, during that time period, some, if not all of the $240,000 was spent on non-traceable items. Uh, we'll talk about what those non-traceable items uh, are and what those non-traceable items aren't. But suffice to say, debts were paid off, food was purchased, travel was incurred, all of those are typical non-traceable items. And so the, the question before the court was, well, is the plan's equitable lien still enforceable? Uh, after all, Sereboff taught us that uh, the lien attaches as soon as the settlement funds are uh, uh, created, and therefore the argument by the plan was that once that lien attaches, it can never be destroyed. Um, the court, however, disagreed and said that you know basically once um, all of the settlement proceeds um, that were subject to the plan's lien have been dissipated on non-traceable items, the plan's equitable lien is destroyed. So uh, ultimately the court remanded the case back to the trial court for discovery on whether there remained any uh, traceable items left from the settlement. Uh, it just wasn't clear from the record whether there was some money that remained or items that could be traced. So next, um, following Montanil, we've really witnessed a number of trends um, out of the plaintiff's bar and lean resolution vendors that you know have kind of gotten on our radar screen. First thing, we've seen an increase in the number of so-called Montanil letters, right? 
Uh, that's what the lawyer did in that case. So that's what everyone calls them now. It's Montanil letters. Uh, those letters give the plan uh, a limited amount of time to object uh, or else the funds will be distributed to the uh, plan member. Second, we've seen um, uh, a significant increase in the amount of attorneys who are simply ignoring or ghosting the plan on smaller liens. So it's a calculated strategy, on, uh, I believe, that just assumes that plans don't have the resources to track down and litigate these smaller dollar liens. So ignore, 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 and ultimately plans will go away, go away, and go away. Um, third, we've seen uh, attorneys who are advising their clients to get the money and spend it as fast as possible. Pay off your debts, pay off your credit cards, uh, satisfy those student loans, take that uh, big vacation, go to the casino, et cetera. Fourth, we've seen uh, recommendations to commingle the money in joint accounts or pass it on to children, et cetera. And fifth, we've seen some uh, attorneys um, who are recommending creating certain special trusts where funds can be shielded by trustees. Um, Nancy's gonna give us a couple examples that I think she's seen or maybe even copy and paste it out of actual cases she's handled here. Hi. Yes, in doing research for this webinar, I uh, took a look at a lot of articles um, because I found in my own experience that when I'm getting an argument that I find to be somewhat novel, I can usually trace it back to a webinar by a trial bar association, um, a, an article that was, you know, you could just put in a couple of key words that will pop up on the screen. But I think these are a little bit uh, telling. And maybe you've seen some of these uh, strategies in your own practice, but I think it's worth going over them because you can understand a little bit the mindset of where these attorneys are coming from and then hopefully combat them. So the first one is uh, a quote that says, the ERISA plan bought, brought a lawsuit to enforce a subrogation claim, but in the meantime, the lawyers dispersed the money out of their trust account and it was put into a completely separate checking account for the client and then the client spent the money, at least most of the money, on non-traceable assets. So that seems to me like a little bit of lawyer involvement to say, you know, this is how we're going to handle this or the best way to handle it. Um, and then leading on to that one, um, the next quote is, so this, the above, gives a whole new way to deal with the really difficult ERISA rules. So uh, I found that to be kind of interesting. Um, another quote, so I tell people, you need to set up a separate bank account for the proceeds and then start paying off all your bills, the list of food and travel and rent and so forth, just out of that account. So um, another way of dealing with the settlement and avoiding a lien. Um, the next quote is, my experience now is again on relatively small claims if they're under say 50,000, they don't seem to be pursuing those, i.e. so just go ahead and ignore them. You know, they're not going to pursue. Um, the next is um, one of the things that we turned to after Sarah Bob's decision was to simply tell the plan that you're not going to pursue litigation and you know, see what they do about it. And we'll get to what you can do about it. Um, the next quote is um, always begin with the fact that these collection agencies like ACS or Rawlings, they'll lie to you. You know, I think that's a, a terrible misrepresentation of what actually happens, but these are actual quotes from personal injury attorneys who have adopted these attitudes post Montanil. So I think um, it's, it's an interesting um, way to look at where they're coming from. It helps you understand a little bit more what you might be getting back at you. So Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, and just to follow up on that, I guess uh, for everyone out there, I'd love to hear, to, to see what you guys are seeing too. So, you know, if you, if you want to, if you're willing to and able to share some of the quotes that come across or some of the letters, you know, just copy and paste it. We'd love to, we'd love to see what, what, what you're being told. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we can incorporate it into a, a future session here um, because some of the stuff that comes across is pretty, it, it's, it's not only um, um, eyebrow raising, but it's also interesting sometimes because um, we, we definitely deal with some characters out there. Mm -hmm. um, so next slide, let me be clear about one thing. And if you take away one thing and one thing only from this post Montanil uh, session, it's that dispersal does not mean 
dissipation. So I think I see this a lot, um, and it comes with those plaintiffs, uh, lawyers who are using these Montanil letters, is that they seem to think that once the funds have been released to their client, that Montanil applies and that plans have no remedy. Now that's just simply not the case. Montanil absolutely endorses the ability of plans to trace settlement funds to their current product, whatever that might be. Um, now, now tracing isn't necessarily easy. It requires, typically requires uh, a lot of discovery, subpoena powers, uh, you know, issuing, um, you know, subpoenas to banks, and we end up often having to comb through bank records, um, checks, um, doing asset searches. Um, so it's it's much easier to be able to resolve these situations before the funds are dispersed. That's that's to be honest. But disbursement does not mean that your lien has been destroyed. So you can go back. We can go back in time. You can go back and look at old files that may have been closed. You know, in the in the recent uh, past. And uh, we can still uh, likely trace some settlement funds um, if, if you need us to. Um, but I would remind you that in addition to some of these added discovery costs, um, we're more likely than not going to need to go to court on these cases to get a temporary restraining order at the outset of any litigation so that we can stop uh, future dissipation of those funds. Um, just another reason not to delay. Um, and then kind of as a tangent on that is one of the things I saw uh, in doing the research for this is that we've got to be careful if you're running out on a Montanil type case where the money is being dispersed and you're going to run to court and ask for a TRO. One thing not to do in your complaint is to plead all of these alternate state law recovery theories. Um, so in other words, um, you know, typically we're going to be filing our 502A3 complaint uh, seeking an equitable lien. We'll seek a, a temporary restraining order that the funds be held in trust. What we don't want to do is throw in these additional claims for state law breach of contract. First of all, it's preempted by ERISA, but um, even ones that we can argue that aren't like maybe conversion um, or unjust enrichment. Um, we don't want to throw those alternative claims in there because that will give a court reason to deny our, prelimi our, our, our preliminary request for a temporary restraining order because those claims don't require tracing. If, if they're cognizable, which they may not be, um, it, in other words, the court's going to say that there's not going to be any irreparable harm because you, after all, you brought a conversion claim and we don't have to worry about dissipation in conversion claims. Um, so be very careful when you're running to court looking for a temporary restraining order that we're limiting our claims just to those under 502A3. Um, but moving on, next slide, let's talk about a few examples um, from actual court decisions that have concluded which items um, are traceable. What, you know, what the first thing is an annuity. So right, we're talking about, um, in many cases, um, a participant will take the settlement funds, uh, either he or his lawyer will, will do this, and purchase an annuity or a structured settlement through an insurance company, uh, whereby they receive ongoing payments in the future. Um, in this Siemens case down in the Northern District of Georgia, the district court held that the plan could trace uh, and recover from this uh, structured annuity. So that's good. Uh, that tells you that um, these these settlement uh, structure settlement vehicles are not going to be able to escape our equitable lien. Um, next, motor vehicles, cars, boats, tractors. You know th these are all going to be traceable assets. So frequently participants will use their newfound settlement money to buy a new toy. So items such as cars, trucks, boats uh, are all going to be traceable items. Uh, again, it means a lot of work. Um, you're going to have to we'll have to figure out a way to, you know, secure that asset and force a sale of it because as much as I would like a new tractor, um, you typically aren't going to have a use for one down at the plant. Um, same goes for homes. Um, we've got, you know, I, I've had one... Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm happy to say, but we got we got a lien on, on, on a mobile home. Um, this case here um, out of California involved a 
um, money that went into a condominium. So a lot of times, um, you know, obviously we talked about the strategy of paying off debts. Well, paying off a mortgage is different because it generates equity in an asset. So courts have permitted us to trace funds into homes, condominiums, et cetera. Um, again, the downside here is the additional work that's gonna require us to force a sale so that we can draw out the cash that we want. Um, and then finally, operating accounts. This is a nice uh, decision, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the commingling aspect of this, but this often comes up when we are pursuing a claim against the attorney. Remember, they're gonna be taking their fees from the trust account and they'll move that into the firm's operating account. And then at the end of the month or the end of the quarter or however frequently they do it, they're gonna be paying out salary. Uh, they're gonna be paying themselves. They're gonna be paying expenses. Um, but if we move quick enough, um, we can still attach our lien to the operating account. The Third Circuit's decision in the Wellspan case again, permitted a plans claim on a general operating account. Um, so one thing, I, again, one thing I'll point out is we still have to move quick because it, once that uh, operating account gets, uh, you know, settled at the end of the month or the end of the quarter, uh, we're gonna have a tracing problem. Um, but my point here is simply that just because the money uh, came from a settlement and has been used to purchase something else, as long as that new asset remains traceable, um, and in the possession of a defendant to our lawsuit, our equitable lien is going to be enforceable. So next, what's the deal with commingling? Um, I think commingling was one of the most popular strategies following Montanil. Uh, first, I think it's it's very easy to accomplish. You just can put it into a joint account with with a spouse or a relative, or you know, just like those Russian oligarchs do. They just you know, we'll put it into a children's account or a relative or, uh, you know, someone else <laughs> that's close to us, but we can still control the money. So um, fortunately, we've had some really great uh, recent decisions from the Third Circuit uh, in Wellspan and the Zerbel decision from the Sixth Circuit uh, have made very clear that commingling in and of itself will not destroy a plan's equitable lien. Um, frankly, I, I think uh, commingling I actually might make it easier for us to recover. So let me explain that one. Um, and to do that, I've got to talk about what the lowest intermediate balance test is. Um, so next slide. So what is the lowest intermediate balance test? So this is a concept under trust law, which is where, you know, ERISA draws from. Um, and it's a doctrine known as the lowest intermediate, intermediate balance rule. Uh, essentially, the lien remains fully intact, even if money is later withdrawn from a commingled account. So long as the value of the commingled account always remains the, above the value of the fund it contains. So um, let me give you an example. If I deposit $50,000 from a settlement into a joint account, as long as the money in the account doesn't go below $50,000, we can always recover our full lien. If the value goes below $50,000, but not to zero, we can only recover up to that amount. So in, in some sense, commingling helps us because the commingler thinks that the funds are now out of reach and will have no incentive to further dissipate those funds. And as long as that commingled account remains at or above the, the lien amount or minimally above zero, we're always going to be able to have assets that are traceable under this doctrine. Um, there was a recent case, this, this uh, Sheet Metals uh, Workers Health and Welfare Fund of North Carolina um, case out of the Sixth Circuit was all teed up for this issue. Um, we even had an amicus brief from the Department of Labor filed in support of the plan and its ability to trace using the lowest intermediate balance test. This was going to be the test case for all of the country that we'd be able to use going forward. Unfortunately, as Sixth Circuit would go on to explain, it had to, just the beginning of the opinion, it started off like this. For those who enjoy 
unsettled legal questions, who would not welcome the opportunity to navigate a labyrinth of ancient equitable doctrines nested within a federal statute with little precedent to inform that review? All of that is presented in this appeal. And add to that the amici participation of a federal agency, and the table is seemingly set for a jurisprudence, jurisprudential feast. But resolution of those issues must remain on ice, so to speak, because they were not preserved for appellate review. So sadly, this argument wasn't argued below uh, and wasn't properly preserved. So the Sixth Circuit had to use uh, judicial restraint and was unable to opine on this rather seemingly uh, 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 awesome issue that we all wanted to hear about. Uh, so the issue will remain out there. Um, it's well briefed and that you can even pull up this amicus brief. Uh, it will be very helpful on future cases because it sets forward, forward the uh, Department of Labor's position on the issue. So next, Nancy is gonna explain to us how we can best respond to these new post montanil strategies. What can we do really on a day-to-day -day basis in our jobs to make sure that we aren't facing possible dissipation or that we're not um, having to run to us for TROs all the time. So Nancy, why don't you walk us through what, 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 uh, what we can do? Okay. All right. So let's start off with the perfect world. So what would have to be in place uh, in a perfect world to obtain the reimbursement interest that you're looking for? So starting with plan language, and I think that's always the starter. So the plan language in both the plan document and the summary plan description create a lien by agreement under Supreme Court precedence. So you want to look at that. A, a lot of plans, I think, regularly update the language in the plans to um, make sure that you take advantage of the most recent Supreme Court precedents. But you've learned a lot here today. Um, so you should be able to take a look at your plan and see what position that you are in. And in a perfect world, Reimbursement and overpayment claims are promptly pursued, including written notice to the attorney holding the settlement funds or just having a lien, filing suit or obtaining other security for the plan. And we'll get to what other security could mean. And in a perfect world, you're fully prepared to pursue tracing or commingling of assets spent by the plan participant. And again, that's the perfect world and probably not our everyday world. So let's take a look at what we can do. So next slide. All right, so let's start again with your plan language. Um, you'll wanna use your plan language and right off the bat. If you are sending out a notice of representation or a notice of lien, um, don't just say, uh, we may have an ERISA lien, something along those lines. Be as informative, educational as you can, who the players are, what the reimbursement rights are, what the current um, claim amount is. Um, and I avoid using claims paid by the plan. I say advanced by the plan. I pick up language exactly from the plan document and include it in that notice of lien letter. So you have great plan language. Uh, make sure that you use it right away. Um, the second thing that you can look for is the participant's eligibility status with the plan. Are they still covered under the plan? Because if they are, you can use that as leverage further down the road. So you want to find that out um, sooner than later. Uh, number three, what are the non-compliance provisions of the plan? Because you'll want to use them. Are there offset provisions? Uh, is withholding allowed? Suspension of benefits, is that something that you can look at? And often overlooked are the ability or is the ability of the plan to secure refunds from providers. If you're not getting the cooperation that you're looking for, if you're not getting the acknowledgement of the reimbursement interest that you're looking for, um, you can always, once again, quote right out of that plan document um, in a letter to uh, the attorney that you're dealing with, or maybe you're not dealing with because they're not answering you. But all of these are strong strategies that you can um, put into place right away to try to get a response and get on the right track, because I think that's what we're always looking for. And it's very helpful if you are um, deliberate and intentional with your documentation from the first letter, um, to every letter that, you know, that goes on between that. Use the information that you already have. Number four, what is the duty to cooperate provision of the plan? If it's in there, it's usually just a, a you know, short little blurb. Use it. Um, you can say, um, 
it, there's a responsibility to respond to requests made by the written by the plan within 14 days. You know, write it that way in your letter to say the plan administrators are requesting an update on the status of the litigation. You know, put it off on them, um, and then they're required to or they have a duty to respond to your question if they're not responding to you or if they're being evasive. Um, number five, do you know um, your state's lawyer ethical duties regarding claims? If you do, then you should use it. There are ABA model rules, but quoting right out of your own particular state, um, rules of professional conduct concerning claims on settlement funds puts that attorney on the hook if they uh, settle the claim without letting you know or if they dissipate those funds. Um, that is one way to, to get them intertwined into any litigation, which will intertwine them anyway because they're a necessary party. Um, but this is another thing that you can do to elicit, elicit the response that you're looking for. Yeah, so again, go ahead Go ahead and run. If you've got a question, run to 1.15 and then find the subsection uh, of the state that you're in if you want to see what the lawyer's obligation is. Um, in many states, in some states, in the minority of states, like, you know, Georgia comes to mind all the time. They, they don't really have that clearly articulated in 1.15. And so lawyers uh, there are, are more apt to just disperse funds that they know another party is claiming. Um, but yeah, 1.15, and then there's a specific subsection depending upon how the states have it numbered in their model rules. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> um, six, consider what is the price of entry to file a lawsuit? Usually plan administrators think, oh, we don't wanna go there, um, but it's what, 400, a little bit more than $400 to file an ERISA 502A3 claim in federal court. Um, that's one way of looking at it, or the other is to draft a complaint, prepare a draft complaint, get it over to the attorney, let them see their client's name and their law firm's name in that plaintiff section, let them read through the claims, and very often you will, it will elicit a response from them. Um, they'll start working with you. You don't want to put the heavy hand down right away, but it's a tool that doesn't cost you much to put together, or, you know, we would be happy to, to put it together for you. Um, in, in an interesting case, I know we're, we're not talking so much about case law here, but in a particular case in the Eastern District of New York, it's Cognetta v. Bonavita, um, 2018 case, the plan filed a deck action to establish a constructive trust for the benefit of the plan before the settlement funds were even in existence. And in that case, the court allowed it. So that's something to consider as well. Um, something else plans have done, they also intervene in the underlying case as a means of protecting uh, their equitable lien. So, there are more things that uh, maybe you think you are, you know, can't do, but this is kind of a good checklist of uh, how to uh, get the best result for, for your plan. So looking on uh, to the next slide, where to finish. Um, where you finish is where you start. You want to create a record. Uh, you want to start immediately. And that starts with your notice of representation as I feel like a broken record uh, saying this over and over, I think your uh, letter of representation or notice um, should be very clear. It should be, uh, you know, again, have the plan language. It should identify who the entities are, who you're representing, and uh, every bit of correspondence that happens afterward, you're creating your record for litigation. You should always bear that in mind. Um, number two, keep the lines of communication open with uh, the personal injury attorney with the participants council. I find that if you really do approach it more in an educational way, you know, I, I have gone on to say, you know, please make sure you've discussed with your client X, Y, or Z. Um, please take a look at the claims itemization. If you have any issues or questions, let me know immediately. Um, otherwise, I will assume that you are in agreement with it. And this sort of avoids the end of the road. Oh, well, none of these claims are related. Um, just really keep those lines of communication open um, and often. Um, number three, confirm the lien status. And uh, again, it was what I just talked about before, remind them in writing, you know, update them regularly as to when the claims increase, because you don't know if they're responding to discovery. You don't know if they have a mediation date coming up. You want to make sure that you're both on the same page with the amount that you are expecting um, as a reimbursement interest. Um, number four, obtain key litigation dates and stay active and involved. I have been involved and Ryan has as well. We're not parties to the case, but we are at the ready during the mediation 
to negotiate, talk with the mediator. I've done that several times um, to try to advance a settlement. Um, you'll want to know any pretrial dates and, you know, shortly before that, send the itemization again. Dear counsel, you know, I understand or and looked at the docket. I research the dockets. I try not to, you know, if I can obtain a docket myself, I will do that, follow along and make sure that I'm sending to that, uh, the attorney, you know, what they need and remind them of our interest in the outcome. Yeah, it's, you know, the get, get the foot in the door approach, right? I mean, in, in fact, I, I, I try to invite myself to, to these mediations as much as possible, right? Um, uh, I mean, sometimes you get free lunch. So, I, I mean, that's a, I mean, right? Don't be uh, a stranger. And, and, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, try to get, insert yourself in there to, to best protect your interests. Exactly. And number five, evaluate the lien reductions appropriately. Now you will have attorneys who at the very beginning of the case will say, well, you know, I, I could really move forward with this case if I knew, you know, what rejection we were gonna take, you know, can't we um, settle the lien now? And the answer is yes and no. You know, if you know that there's a policy limit and that's all there will be, then yes, you could possibly approach the plan administrators and come up with a three-way split or some kind of a reduction that's appropriate. If they don't know how it's going to end up and you don't know how it's going to end up, your plan cannot, enter into a reduction um, appropriately. They don't have enough information to do that. But what you can do is you can reiterate or at least outline, you know, right at the beginning that the plan will consider the facts and circumstances of this particular case. And you, know, you can go through the list of, you know, how far did the litigation go? Uh, what was the value of the case? What is the settlement? There are a lot of factors that go into the evaluation of a reduction. And at least it gives the personal injury attorney the sense that it's going to be fairly evaluated. It's really that you are trying to fairly evaluate. So, you know, try to avoid the hostility or any negative uh, interactions. Everybody kind of wins in the end. And if they feel along the way from the very beginning, you've been doing nothing but, you know, educating them about their client's obligations to the plan and keeping them posted on the lien amount. Um, being actively interested and involved in the litigation, the better outcomes you will eventually get. And number six, call for help when you need it. Know when things are moving in the wrong direction. Either you're not getting an answer at all, um, you're getting something, you know, very combative. Oh, I'm dropping the case. You can pick it up. Are you going to be, you know, filing a notice of appearance? If things start to go in the wrong direction, definitely reach out for help. Don't wait. Uh, I've had cases where um, you know, we received the file and um, someone from the a plan representative has been negotiating or fighting with a personal injury attorney for a full year and getting nowhere. And in the course of all of the correspondence that I'm reading, you know, not once are they mentioning the language of the plan. It, it's just kind of a cat fight, which can be avoided. You know, that that doesn't do any good for anyone. So, you know, feel free to reach out to us or another voice sometimes brings um, things back into focus and back on track. If you have a, you know, a completely separate person say, okay, you can sort of reset and, and move in the right direction. So. Um, yes, the, the, old, the old good cop, bad cop uh, approach, right? Yeah, it, it, it does work. It does work. I mean, Catherine, one, is our, Catherine is our resident bad cop. So just, just so <laughs> just everyone knows. And I'm the resident good cop until you make me mad. And then, you know, wow. Um, so that's pretty much it. If you have any questions about that, we're happy to you know, answer them offline or if you want to go in the chat box. But um, I think that pretty much covers where we are in the post montennial world and, and how to deal with it. Awesome. Thanks, Nancy. Catherine, bad cop, you want to go for it? <laughs> I try to be nice, but sometimes they're just not cooperative. Um, so anyway, moving on to stop loss, complete change of topic. So first off, what is it? So I'm, I'm sure this is the old hat to most of you, but it's financial insurance for the plan or for the employer who's operating the plan. And that can vary a little bit depending on whether or not the plan is a distinct legal entity from the employer. But basically how it works is that a, a self-funded plan is going to pay all of the claims that come in that are compensable under the plan itself. 
theoretically, this decision should not have anything to do with stop loss coverage. And then after those claims are paid, any that are above a certain trigger threshold are going to get reimbursed to the plan by a stop loss insurer. The contract is, has nothing to do with the participant. It doesn't determine coverage under the plan. And most importantly, it does not provide benefits to participants directly. Um, and they don't, and stop loss should not be making decisions about the coverage that's offered under the plan itself or whether or not benefits are approved. There are a few different ways that a plan can um, figure out how its deductible will be triggered. So the, the two most common ones that you'll see are specific and aggregate. And so a specific deductible just means that you're making reference to um, either an individual or a family who's on the plan hitting a certain dollar threshold. And so that's typically gonna be a threshold in the five figure range, in the, yeah, in the five figure range. So maybe $50,000. An aggregate deductible is what happens when the plan as a whole hits a certain threshold. So literally everybody in a certain plan year, maybe nobody hits their specific deductible, maybe only one or two did, but you know, on average, we're, we're seeing more claims this year than we usually do. And so we want to have that protection for the plan in case, you know, let's say you do have something like, like the example on the screen where you have a $50,000 specific and a $500,000 aggregate. Um, if you have a ton of plan participants that only hit 45, you need that $500,000 aggregate to make sure that that everything doesn't go off the rails just because uh, no one individual hits that, that one uh, number. The other thing that you might wanna watch out for that you might hear about if you're talking to either the carrier or the plan is something called a specific aggregating deductible. Um, and I was in the industry for years before I actually knew what this meant. <laughs> so basically what it is, is that, so this is, this is going to be a plan that has specific deductibles. So let's say um, maybe that $50,000 number. But the plan knows that, you know, if only one person goes over the specific deductible, they may be able to manage that risk themselves. They may not necessarily need the coverage. And so they want to talk to their stop loss insurer about, is there a way to, you know, keep our premiums down where we are able to absorb a little bit of that risk? And what you, what you do with that is the specific aggregating. So if one person hits their specific deductible and only goes over by a little bit, there's essentially a buffer zone where the plan is not going to be permitted to submit for stop loss reimbursement until either one person or a few people on the plan all go over their specific deductible by a preset amount. And so the next slide, we're gonna, we're gonna do an example of that. So if the plan has a $50,000 specific deductible, but another $75,000 in a specific aggregating deductible, you can have the following scenario. So in, in January, person A hit $60,000. So that person has hit their $50,000 specific deductible, but because they've only gone over by $10,000, the plan isn't gonna get reimbursed because that $10,000 is going to go into the $75,000 specific aggregating. So in February, when a totally different person gets $75,000 in claims, that 25 that's over the 50 specific is going to get added to the specific aggregating, which is now totaling $35,000. And so the plan is still going to be responsible for all of these claims, and they're not going to get reimbursed from stop loss. But then in March, person A needs another surgery and incurs another $50,000 in claims, which pushes the plan into $85,000 in claims that are over any individual specific deductible, meaning that they're now going to be eligible, assuming all of those claims are, you know, covered by the stop loss policy, covered by the plan, all of those, you know, traditional prerequisites, the plan will now be eligible for $10,000 in reimbursement under that specific aggregating deductible. 
And now for the rest of the year, anybody who goes over that traditional $50,000 specific deductible um, who has eligible claims, those claims will now turn over to be eligible for reimbursement under the stop loss. So that's kind of the basic setup for a stop loss policy. You may have a, a plan that has a unique setup and those are uh, you know, things that you should be looking into, but those are the three kind of basics. So now, what are some practical concerns if uh, you're a case handler and or um, if you're a plan and you're thinking about how is stop loss going to impact my subrogation recoveries and what are some things that I need to be thinking about as I select a stop loss policy? So one thing that we, thankfully I don't see as much of it, um, but some things that, that you do see occasionally are plans holding off on paying claims because they're waiting for quote unquote approval from stop loss or some kind of you know confirmation that stop loss is going to reimburse those claims once they've paid. Um, that's not how self-funded plans work and that's not how stop loss coverage works. The stop loss coverage is only going to cover eligible expenses under the plan, but stop loss doesn't get to make that determination for the plan itself. And what can sometimes cause confusion is a provision that you'll see in stop loss policies that says, we, the stop loss carrier, are not going to defer to you, the plan, regarding what is eligible when we make our determination for what we're going to reimburse you for. So let's say the plan has some kind of ambiguous exclusion and the, and the plan administrator decides, okay, this exclusion does not apply in this scenario. And so these claims are eligible, we're going to pay them. Because that's the plan administrator's decision, those claims are eligible under the plan and they have to be paid for the plan participant. What can then happen if, depending on how your stop loss policy is written, the stop loss carrier may have a provision that says, well, we're not going to defer to that interpretation. We're going to interpret that language differently and say that these claims, because we wouldn't find them eligible under the plan, aren't reimbursable under the stop loss policy. And in that case, what the plan administrator has is a gap in coverage. You know, they, they still owe those benefits to the plan participants. They should have been paid already, um, but they may have an issue where they can't get that reimbursement from the stop loss carrier. And so those gaps can occur when you have a stop loss policy that isn't coextensive with the benefits offered by the plan. Um, the times we see these come up kind of most often are with certain exclusions. So for example, um, if an illegal activities exclusion doesn't necessarily require that a charge be filed or that a conviction exists, um, stop loss carriers and plans can have different interpretations of when they should apply. We also see, or, or certainly seeing more commonly with some of the more economic stop loss policies with the lower premiums, they may be insisting that claims be paid at a fair rate based on some kind of reference-based pricing model. So, you know, no more than 200% of Medicare or something like that, which is a problem for plans that have a more traditional network agreement that have agreed to pay, say, 80% of the bill charge, because we all know that those numbers may not match up. And so those are things that plans need to be looking at before they even enter into these contracts to make sure that they're minimizing those gaps and that there's certainly that there aren't these kind of obvious gaps that are going to lead challenges down the road the first time you have to make a claim under the policy yeah that's a whole nother seminar that could take yeah. uh, a long time but you know oh, yes. that if you're a reference-based pricing plan you 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 are going to have a gap with your stop loss coverage just almost guarantee it so um that's one thing to look at for sure yeah um and especially for reference-based pricing plans um something to keep in mind um especially in you, you know even in subrogation cases but especially so in in some more traditional claims uh processing issues timing can really be key there are a lot of contracts obviously that um the the contracts are typically written so that they'll cover a particular plan year but they will often have a cutoff date by which the claims must be paid. And I've seen tons of policies 
where that cutoff date is actually the same day as the end of the plan year. So let's, let's say you have a calendar year plan that ends on December 31st. You may have a stop loss policy that says, you know, we'll cover claims through December 31st, so long as you actually paid the provider by that date, which as we all know, is just not how any billing or payment works. Um, and so if you've got end of year treatment, those can create real time crunches, um, even in cases that have a little bit of a, of a buffer period, you have to make sure that, you know, those claims are getting submitted timely to the plan, that the plan is processing them quickly, that if there's more information needed. So if, if for example, those claims are being held up for some sort of accident questionnaire or acknowledgement of the plan subrogation rights, those things need to be handled in a in a timely manner if there are potentially stop loss implications, because it, it might not just be whether or not the claims get paid for the participant, but whether or not uh, the plan is going to be eligible for any of that stop loss coverage to have the gap in between uh, the subrogation recovery and the claims payments. So if you're handling a subrogation case, how do you know if stop loss is involved? Um, in an ideal world, the vendor that's handling this for the stop loss or the stop loss carrier themselves, if they handle in-house, is going to reach out to you and say something. Hopefully, they will reach out to you rather than you hearing from the participant's attorney, oh, I got this call from this other guy. I, I don't know what's going on. Why are there two of you all of a sudden? Um, Obviously, if you're handling cases, it's going to be extremely hard to guess a plan's aggregate deductible or whether or not they've hit it because you're only looking at one case. And so that may not be a viable strategy for you to be thinking about in every file, you know, is stop loss involved because maybe this plan hit their aggregate deductible. But you will sometimes be contacted by a, by a vendor for the stop loss carrier on an aggregate claim. But you should be looking at every case that's worth about $35,000 or above and thinking about, do I know if there's stop loss involved? Do I have access to a copy of the stop loss contract for this plan? Their specific deductible is unlikely to change substantially year over year. And so if you know last year their specific deductible was $100,000, you probably don't need to be as worried about a $35,000 case. If you know that they're a very large plan that's likely to have a higher specific deductible, you know, maybe you set your threshold a little higher. But if you're not really sure what kind of plan you're working with, $35,000 is a good threshold to start thinking about. Is there stop loss involvement? Is there this other interest that I have to worry about? Because the stop loss contract is between the stop loss carrier and the plan or the employer. The participant is not a party to that contract. And so the stop loss carrier doesn't have any direct rights against the plan participant. What the vast majority of stop loss contracts will say, however, is that if the plan either isn't protecting the subrogation rights or isn't adequately protecting the subrogation rights, or you know, I've seen a couple plans where it's just if the stop loss carrier feels like it, the stop loss carrier may have the ability to step into the shoes of the plan and take some control over that subrogation and reimbursement file that you're handling, which is why you're going to want to review the contract early to make sure you understand what that interplay is going to be. Even if the stop loss carrier hasn't reached out to you, I cannot recommend enough, if you know that there is some kind of stop loss involvement, to make sure that when the plan is considering a reduction, they think about, is this going to enable them to fully uh, adhere to any obligations they might have with their stop loss carrier? Because if, if the plan is thinking about getting $50,000 back and the stop loss carrier has a $75,000 interest, is the plan going to be breaching its stop loss contract by accepting less than the full amount that it's been reimbursed by stop loss? It may not be, but a lot of stop loss policies will have a provision where the carrier is entitled to at a minimum notice, if not approval, 
of any settlement that you might be thinking of or the plan might be thinking of entering into that wouldn't allow it to receive full reimbursement. Um, the stop loss contract usually will entitle a stop loss carrier to essentially first priority reimbursement from anything that the plan receives. That's not always the case. So please do check. Um, I have literally handled the case with a stop loss carrier where the stop loss contract explicitly said that the plan got first dollar and the stop loss carrier essentially only got the excess. So it worked in reverse of the normal policy. So you, you should be checking those. You should also be checking for common things that we look at in the subrogation and reimbursement context when we're handling cases for the plan. How are attorney's fees and costs or vendor fees and costs divided? Is the stop loss carrier going to be reimbursing for attorney's fees and costs that are incurred in pursuing the plan's interest? If the case has to go to litigation, who is going to be the point person and how are those costs going to be split? Because the, if the plan is seriously considering litigation, something that they might want to be thinking about is, well, after I pay an attorney, after I pay the filing fee, after I deal with you know costs associated with depositions, is that going to eat so much into the practical potential recovery that only the stop loss carrier is going to get something back such that that might not make it worth it to me? Now, the stop loss carrier under those circumstances may be very interested in stepping in, um, but those are conversations that you need to make sure that you're facilitating between the plan and the stop loss carrier if the case is, is potentially going to litigation or going to get complicated. So we talked last week about these uh, 1024 requests, these all documents under which the plan is established or operated. And so you'd think that because a stop loss policy isn't a plan document, it doesn't determine benefits, it's not a, a document under which the plan is established or operated. And that's what most of the courts that have evaluated this question have determined. But as with everything, there are some exceptions. Um, there is at least one case where specifically because the stop loss policy wasn't produced, the plan was subject to $41,000 in fines under this 1024 provision. And I cannot say this enough. Always, always, always look at your plan document to determine what it says you have to turn over in the 1024 context. I've seen plan documents that say, you know, all of the insurance contracts with the employer, which would include a stop loss policy. I've seen uh, plan documents that specifically say that they're going to turn over the ASA. And so, you know, there may be documents that you don't traditionally have to turn over, but you might in your specific case because of what your plan says. Um, this one, um, the slideshow is going to be available and you're going to be welcome to see all of these uh, citations, but th these are just a few of the circuit decisions that have explained very clearly that just because you have stop loss, because that's financial insurance for the plan, rather than any kind of health insurance for the plan participant, that doesn't automatically void the self-funded status. So. You know, it's not that the plan is only self-funded up to whatever its retention point is. The plan is self-funded, period, if it has a traditional stop-loss policy. Um, the trick there, I say, is if it has a traditional stop-loss policy, because there have been a couple of cases that we've seen. Um, this first one at top, the Northern District of Mississippi, the plan literally didn't have any deductibles. Every single, every from the first dollar it paid, those claims were all eligible for reimbursement under its stop loss contract. And so in that case, the court said, hey, th this isn't a traditional stop loss policy. This is, you're, you're trying to get the benefits of being self-funded without literally taking on any of the risk. And, and we're not going to essentially let you get away with that. And so if you have a stop loss policy that isn't uh, managed in the, in the traditional way, that may be something that you have to justify to a court. 
Um, the Fifth Circuit has also flagged that, you know, if you've only got a spec deductible in the three figures, that's something we're going to look closely at. And we're going to look at the substance of the relationship between the plan participants and the carrier. We're not just going to look at what you call it. And so if what you're really trying to do is purchase insurance for the participants, um, if you're just act doing, acting as a conduit, to that actual insurer and not really self-funding your benefits, we're not just going to rubber stamp you and say that you're still self-funded. And so that's, that's something that you should be careful about. Well, thanks, Catherine. That was really awesome. Um, so if anyone out there has more questions on stop loss, uh, feel free to uh, send them over. I'm sure that Catherine or I could handle them, but um, uh, that was excellent. Um, so last but not least, I, I would like to, um, to talk about our next webinar. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, so far we've kind of gone into the weeds, really tackling some really in-depth, um, high level ERISA issues and, and, uh, some nuance. Um, we're going to kind of take this one back, uh, this next one, uh, June 21st, uh, same time, 12 Eastern. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, ERISA 101, so we're going to go back to the basics. Um, we're going to take you not only back to some of the foundational principles uh, for why we do what we do, but you know, give you some guidance and practical advice on how to be handling um, ERISA subrogation claims on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and you know, we're we're not going to try. We're going to try to not uh, talk over anyone's head. Try to you know. Uh, you know, especially if you're if you're newer to the um, to the industry, we'll try to meet you where you are. Um, but it should be a good one. Um, and um, looking forward to you guys joining us. Then we'll we'll have a webinar invite out shortly. Um, but thanks again for everyone for joining us today, um, and look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Thank you.